Chapter Seven: The War in the Air. We Americans are a peace-loving people, which is the very reason why we went into the war we had to help down the power that was disturbing the peace of the world we do not believe in conquests at least of the type that germany tried to force and yet there are certain conquests that we do indulge in once in a while eleven years before germany undertook to conquer europe two young americans made the greatest conquest that the world has ever seen the wright brothers sailed up into the heavens and gained the mastery of the air they offered their conquest to the united states but while we accepted their offering with enthusiasm at first we did not know what to do with the new realm after we got it there seemed to be no particular use in flying it was just a bit too risky to be pleasant sport and about all we could see in it was an exhibition for the circus or the county fair not so in europe however flying meant something over there there where the frontiers have ever bristled with big guns and strong fortifications and where huge military forces have slept on their arms never knowing what dreadful war the morning would bring forth the war lovers hailed the airplane as a new instrument with which to terrorize their neighbors the peace lovers saw in it another menace to their homes it gave them a new frontier to defend and so the military powers of europe took up the airplane seriously and earnestly and developed it at first military authorities had rated the airplane chiefly as a flying scout some bomb dropping experiments had been made with it but it proved very difficult to land the bombs near the target and besides machines of those days were not built to carry very heavy loads so that it did not seem especially profitable to attack the enemy from the skies as for actual battles up among the clouds they were dreamed of only by the writers of fiction but wild dreams became stern realities in the mighty struggle between the great powers of the world eyes in the sky as a scouting machine the airplane did prove to be far superior to mounted patrols which used to perform scout work in fact it changed completely the character of modern warfare from his position high up in the heavens the flying scout had an unobstructed view of the country for miles and he could see just what the enemy was doing he could see whether large forces of men were collecting for an attack he could watch the course of supply trains and judge of their size he could locate the artillery of the enemy and come back with information which in former times a scout posted in a tall tree or even in a captive balloon could not begin to acquire surprise attacks were impossible with eyes in the sky the aviator could help his own batteries by signalling to them where to send their shell and when the firing began he would spot the shots as they landed and signal back to the battery how to correct its aim so as to drop the shell squarely on the target the french sprang a surprise on the germans by actually attacking the infantry from the sky the idea of attack from overhead was so novel that armies did not realize the danger of exposing themselves behind the battlefront long convoys of trucks and masses of infantry moved freely over the roads behind the lines and they were taken by surprise when the french began dropping steel darts upon them these were about the size of a pencil with pointed end and fluted tail so that they would travel through the air like an arrow the darts were dropped by the hundred wherever the airmen saw a large group of the enemy and they struck with sufficient velocity to pierce a man from head to foot but steel darts were not used very long the enemy took to cover and then the only way to attack him was to drop explosives which would blow up his shelter at the outset air scouts were more afraid of the enemy on the ground than in the sky the germans had anti-aircraft guns that were fired with accuracy and accounted for many allied planes in those days airplanes flew at comparatively low altitudes and they were well within the reach of the enemy's guns but it was not long before the airplanes began to fight one another each side was very much annoyed by the flying scouts of its opponents and after a number of pistol duels in the sky the french began to arm their planes with machine guns two months after the war started the first airplane was sent crashing to earth after a battle in the sky 
the fight took place five thousand feet above the earth between a french and a german machine the german pilot was killed and the plane fell behind the french lines carrying with it a prussian nobleman who died before he could be pulled out of the wreckage the war had been carried into the skies but if scouts were to fight one another they could not pay much attention to scouting and spotting and it began to be realized that there were four distinct classes of work for the airplane to do scouting artillery spotting battling and bombing each called for special training and its own type of machine as air fighting grew more specialized these classes were further subdivided but we need not go into such refinements air scouts and their dangers the scouting airplane usually carried two men one to drive the machine and the other to make observations the observer had to carry a camera to take photographs of what lay below and he was usually equipped with a wireless outfit with which he could send important information back to his own base the camera was sometimes fitted with a stock like that of a gun so that it could be aimed from the shoulder some small cameras were shaped so that they could be held in the hand like a pistol and aimed over the side of the fuselage or body of the airplane but the best work was done with large cameras fitted with telescopic lenses or telephoto lenses as they were called some of these were built into the airplane with lenses opening down through the bottom of the fuselage the scouting airplane carried a machine gun not for attack but for defense it had to be a quick climber and a good dodger so that it could escape from an attacking plane usually it did not have to go very far into the enemy country and it was provided with a large wing spread so that if anything happened to the engine it could volplane or glide back to its own lines as the scouting planes were large they offered a big target to anti-aircraft guns and so the work of the air scout was to swoop down upon the enemy when of course the machine would be travelling at high velocity because it would have all the speed of falling added to that which its own propeller gave it it was really a very difficult matter to hit a rapidly moving airplane and even if it were hit there were few spots in which it could be mortally wounded hundreds of shots could go through the wings of an airplane without impairing its flying in the least the engine too could be pretty well peppered with ordinary bullets without being disabled as for the men in the machine they furnished small targets and even they could be hit in many places without being put entirely out of business and so the dangers of air scouting were not so great as might at first be supposed one of the most vulnerable spots in the airplane was the gasoline tank if that were punctured so that the fuel would run out the airplane would have to come to the ground worse still the gasoline might take fire and there was nothing the aviator dreaded more than fire there were occasions in which he had to choose between leaping to earth and burning to death and the former was usually preferred as a quicker and less painful death in some of the later machines the gasoline tank could be pitched overboard if it took fire by the throwing of a lever and then the aviator could glide to earth in safety the self-healing gasoline tank one of the contributions which we made to military aeronautics was a gasoline tank that was puncture proof it was made of soft rubber with a thin lining of copper there were some very soft erasers on the market through which you can pass a lead pencil and never find the hole after it has passed through because the rubber has closed in and healed the wound such was the rubber used in the gasoline tank it could be peppered with bullets and yet would not leak a drop of gasoline unless the bullet chanced to plough along the edge of the tank and open a long gash the germans used four different kinds of cartridges in their aircraft guns the first carried the ordinary bullet a second type had for its bullet a shell of german silver filled with a phosphor compound this was automatically ignited through a small opening in the base of the shell when it was fired from the gun and it left a trail of smoke by which the gunner could trace its course through the air and correct his aim at night the bright spot of light made by the burning compound would serve the same purpose such a bullet if it hit an ordinary gasoline tank would set fire to its contents 
the bullet would plough through the tank and out at the opposite side and there at its point of exit is where the gasoline would be set on fire such incendiary bullets were repeatedly fired into or through the rubber tanks and the hole would close behind the bullet preventing the contents from taking fire the two other types of bullets referred to were an explosive bullet or tiny shell which would explode on striking the target and a perforating steel bullet which was intended to pierce armor or penetrate into vital parts of an airplane engine machines with which artillery spotting was done were usually manned by a pilot and an observer so that the latter could devote his entire attention to noting the fire of the guns and signalling ranges without being hampered by having to drive the machine these machines were usually of the pusher type so that the observer could have an unobstructed view they did not have to be fast machines it was really better for them to move slowly had it been possible for them to stop altogether and hover over the spot that was being shelled it would have been a distinct advantage that would have given the observer a chance to note with better accuracy the fall of the shell like the scout the spotter had to be a fast climber so that it could get out of the range of enemy guns and run away from attacking planes giants of the sky the largest warplanes were the bomb-dropping machines. They had to be capable of carrying heavy loads of explosives. They were usually slow machines, speed being sacrificed in carrying capacity. The Germans paid a great deal of attention to big bomb-dropping machines, particularly after their Zeppelins proved a failure. Their huge Gottas were built to make night raids on undefended cities the italians and the british retaliated with machines that were even larger at first the french were inclined to let giant planes alone they did not care to conduct long-distance bombing raids on german cities because their own important cities were so near the battlefront that the germans could have done those places more harm than the french could have inflicted later they built some giant machines although not so large as those of the italians and the british the large triplane capronis built by the italians held a crew of three men they were armed with three guns and carried two thousand seven hundred and fifty pounds of explosives that made a useful load of four thousand pounds the machine was driven by three engines with a total of nine hundred horsepower the big british plane was the handley page which had a wing spread of a hundred and twenty five feet and could carry a useful load of three tons these enormous machines conducted their raids at night because they were comparatively slow and could not defend themselves against speedy battle planes the big italian machines used searchlight bombs to help them locate important points on the ground beneath these were brilliant magnesium torches suspended from parachutes so that they would fall slowly and give a broad illumination while the airplane itself was shielded from the light by the parachute but these giants were not the only bombing machines there were smaller machines that operated over the enemy's battle line and dropped bombs on any suspicious object behind the enemy lines these machines had to be convoyed by fast battle planes which fought off hostile airmen how fast is a hundred and fifty miles per hour in naval warfare the battleship is the biggest and heaviest ship of the fleet but in the air the battle planes are the lightest and the smallest of the lot they are one-man machines as a rule little fellows but enormously speedy speed is such an important factor in aerial warfare that there was a continuous struggle between the opposing forces to produce the faster machine airplanes were constantly growing speedier until a speed of a hundred and fifty miles per hour was not an uncommon rate of travel it is hard to imagine such a speed as that but we may gain some idea if we consider a falling object the observation platform of the woolworth building in new york is about seven hundred and fifty feet above the ground if you should drop an object from this platform you would start it on a journey that would grow increasingly speedy particularly as it neared the ground 
by the time it had dropped from the sixtieth floor to the fifty-ninth it would have attained a speed of nearly twenty miles per hour we are not making any allowances for the resistance of the air and what it would do to check the speed as it passed the fiftieth floor it would be travelling as fast as an express train or sixty miles per hour it would finally reach the ground with a speed equal to that of a fast battle plane a hundred and fifty miles per hour the battle plane was usually fitted with a single machine gun that was fixed to the airplane so that it was brought to bear on the target by aiming the entire machine in this the plane was something like a submarine which must point its bow at its intended victim in order to aim its torpedo the operator of the battle plane simply drove his machine at the enemy and touched a button on his steering lever to start his machine gun going shooting through the propeller now the fleetest machines and the most easily manoeuvred are those of the tractor type that is the ones which have the propeller in front but having the propeller in front is a handicap for a single-seater machine for the gun has to be fired through the propeller and the bullets are sure to hit the propeller blades nevertheless the french did fire right through the propeller regardless of whether or not the blades were hit but at the point where they came in line with the fire of the gun they were armored with steel so that there was no danger of their being cut by the bullets it was calculated that not more than one bullet in eighteen would strike the propeller blade and be deflected from its course which was a very trifling loss nevertheless it was a loss and on this account a mechanism was devised which would time the operations of the machine gun so that the shots would come only when the propeller blades were clear of the line of fire a cam placed on the propeller shaft worked the trigger of the machine gun this did not slow up the fire of the machine gun quite the contrary we are apt to think of the fire of the machine guns as very rapid but they usually fire only about five hundred rounds per minute while an airplane propeller will make something like twelve hundred revolutions per minute and so the mechanism was arranged to pull the trigger only once for every two revolutions of the propeller fighting among the clouds there was no service of the war that began to compare with that of the sky fighter he had to climb to enormous heights air battles took place at elevations of twenty thousand feet the higher the battle plane could climb the better because the man above had a tremendous advantage clouds were both a haven and a menace to him at any moment an enemy airplane might burst out of the clouds upon him he had to be ready to go through all the thrilling tricks of a circus performer so as to dodge the other fellow and get a commanding position if he were getting the worst of it he might feign death and let his machine go tumbling and fluttering down for a thousand feet or so only to recover his equilibrium suddenly and dart away when the enemy was thrown off his guard he might escape into some friendly cloud but he dared not hide in it very long lest he get lost it is a peculiar sensation that comes over an aviator when he is flying through a thick mass of clouds he is cut off from the rest of the world he can hear nothing but the terrific roar of his own motor and the hurricane rush of the wind against his ears he can see nothing but the bluish fog of the clouds he begins to lose all sense of direction his compass appears to swing violently to and fro when really it is his machine that is zigzagging under his unsteady guidance the more he tries to steady it the worse becomes the swing of the compass as he turns he banks his machine automatically just as a bicyclist does when rounding a corner he does this unconsciously and he may get to spinning round and round with his machine standing on its side in some cases aviators actually emerged from the clouds with their machines upside down to be sure this was not an alarming position for an experienced aviator at the same time it was not altogether a safe one a machine was sometimes broken by its operator's efforts to right it suddenly and so while the clouds made handy shelters they were not always safe harbors to the battle plane fell the task of clearing the air of the enemy 
if the enemy's battle planes were disposed of his bombing planes his spotters and his scouts could not operate and he would be blind and so each side tried to beat out the other with speedier more powerful and more numerous battle planes fast double-seaters were built with guns mounted so that they could turn in any direction the flying tank the germans actually built an armored battle plane known as the flying tank it was a two-seater intended mainly for attacking infantry and was provided with two machine guns that pointed down through the floor of the fuselage a third gun mounted on a revolving wooden ring could be used to fight off hostile planes the bottom and sides of the fuselage or body of the airplane from the gunner's cockpit forward were sheathed with plates of steel armor the machine was a rather cumbersome craft and did not prove very successful a flying tank was brought down within the american lines just before the signing of the armistice america's help our own contribution to the war in the air was considerable but we had hardly started before the armistice brought the fighting to an end before we entered the war we did not give the airplane any very serious consideration to be sure we built a large number of airplanes for the british but they were not good enough to be sent to the front they were used merely as practice machines in the british training schools we knew that we were hopelessly outclassed but we did not care very much then we stepped into the conflict what can we do to help we asked our allies and their answer gave us a shock airplanes they cried build us airplanes thousands of them so that we can drive the enemy out of the air and blind his armies it took us a while to recover from our surprise and then we realized why we had been asked to build airplanes the reputation of the united states as a manufacturer of machinery had spread throughout the world we americans love to take hold of a machine and turn it out in big quantities our allies were sure that we could turn out first-class airplanes and many of them if we tried congress made an appropriation of six hundred and forty million dollars for aeronautics and then things began to hum a birthday present to the nation the heart of an airplane is its engine we know a great deal about gasoline engines especially automobile engines but an airplane engine is a very different thing it must be tremendously powerful and at the same time extremely light every ounce of unnecessary weight must be shaved off it must be built with the precision of a watch its vital parts must be true to a ten thousandth part of an inch it takes a very powerful horse to develop one horsepower for a considerable length of time it would take a hundred horses to supply the power for even a small airplane and they would weigh a hundred and twenty thousand pounds an airplane motor of the same power would weigh less than three hundred pounds which is a quarter of the weight of a single horse it was this powerful yet most delicate machine that we were called upon to turn out by the thousand there was no time to waste a motor must be designed that could be built in the american way without any tinkering or fussy handwork two of our best engineers met in a hotel in washington on june three nineteen seventeen and worked for five days without once leaving their rooms they had before them all the airplane knowledge of our allies american engine builders offered up their trade secrets everything was done to make this motor worthy of america's reputation there was a race to have the motor finished by the fourth of july sure enough on independence day the finished motor was there in washington the liberty motor a birthday present to the nation of course that did not mean that we were ready at once to turn out liberty motors by the thousand the engine had to undergo many tests and a large number of alterations before it was perfectly satisfactory and then special machinery had to be constructed before it could be manufactured in quantity it was thanksgiving day before the first manufactured liberty was turned out and even after that change upon change was made in this little detail and that it was not until a year after we went to war that the engine began to be turned out in quantity 
there was nothing startlingly new about the engine it was a composite of a number of other engines but it was designed to be turned out in enormous quantities and it was remarkably efficient it weighed only eight hundred and twenty five pounds and it developed over four hundred and twenty horsepower some machines went up as high as four hundred and eighty five horsepower an airplane engine weighing less than two pounds per horsepower is wonderfully efficient of course the liberty was too heavy for a light battle plane a heavy machine no matter how powerful cannot make sharp turns but it was excellent for other types of airplanes and large orders for liberty engines were made by our allies of course we made other engines as well and the planes to carry them we built large caproni and handley page machines and we were developing some remarkably swift and powerful planes of our own when the germans thought it about time to stop fighting flying boats so far we have said nothing about the seaplanes which were used in large numbers to watch for submarines these were big flying boats in which speed was not a very important matter one of the really big machines we developed but which was not finished until after the war was a giant with a hundred and ten foot span and a body or hull fifty feet long during the war seaplanes carried wireless telephone apparatus with which they could call to destroyers and submarine chasers when they spotted a submarine they also carried bombs which they could drop on u-boats and even heavy guns with which they could fire a shell a still later development are the giant planes of the nc type with a wing spread of a hundred and twenty six feet and driven by four liberty motors they carry a useful load of four and a half tons early in the war large guns were mounted on airplanes but the shock of the recoil proved too much for the airplane to stand however an american inventor produced a gun which had no recoil this he accomplished by using a double-end gun which was fired from the middle the bullet or shell was shot out in the forward end of the gun and a dummy charge of sand was shot out at the rear end the sand spread out and did no damage at a short distance from the gun but care had to be taken not to come too close these non-recoil guns were made in different sizes to fire one and a half inch to three inch shell the automatic seaplane another interesting development was the target airplane used for the training of aerial gunners this was a small seaplane with a span of only eighteen and a half feet driven by a twelve horsepower motor the whole machine weighing but a hundred and seventy five pounds this was sent up without a pilot and it would fly at the rate of forty to fifty miles per hour until its supply of gasoline gave out when it would drop down into the sea it afforded a real target for gunners in practice machines early in the war an american inventor proposed that seaplanes be provided with torpedoes which they could launch at an enemy ship the seaplane would swoop down out of the sky to within a short distance of the ship drop its projectile and fly off again and the torpedo would continue on its course until it blew up the vessel it was urged that a fleet of such seaplanes protected by a convoy of fast battle planes could invade the enemy harbors and destroy its powerful fleet it seemed like a rather wild idea but the british actually built such torpedo planes and tested them however the german fleet surrendered before it was necessary to blow it up in such fashion airplanes after the war with the war ended all the allied powers have large numbers of airplanes on their hands and also large numbers of trained aviators undoubtedly airplanes will continue to fill the skies in europe and we shall see more and more of them in this country even during the war they were used for other purposes than fighting there were ambulances on wings machines with the top of the fuselage removable so that a patient on a stretcher could be placed inside a french machine was furnished with a complete hospital equipment for emergency treatment and even for performing an operation in case of necessity the flying hospital could carry the patient back to the field or base hospital after treatment mail-carrying airplanes are already an old story 
in europe the big bombing machines are being used for passenger service between cities there is an airline between paris and london the airplanes carry from a dozen to as many as fifty passengers on a single trip in some cities here as well as abroad the police are being trained to fly so that they can police the heavens when the public takes to wings evidently the flying era is here End of chapter seven chapter eight ships that sail the skies shortly after the civil war broke out thaddeus s c lowe an enthusiastic american aeronaut conceived the idea of sending up scout balloons to reconnoitre the position of the enemy these balloons were to be connected by telegraph wires with the ground so that they could direct the artillery fire the idea was so novel to the military authorities of that day that it was not received with favor balloons were looked upon as freak inventions entirely impractical for the stern realities of war and as for telegraphing from a balloon no one had ever done that before but this enthusiast was not to be daunted and he made a direct appeal to president lincoln offering to prove the practicability of this means of scouting so he took his balloon to washington and made an ascent from the grounds of the smithsonian institute while the president came out on the lawn south of the white house to watch the demonstration in order to test him mr lincoln took off his hat waved his handkerchief and made other signals lowe observed each act through his field glasses and reported it to the president by telegraph mr lincoln was so impressed by the demonstration that he ordered the army to use the observation balloon and with some reluctance the gas bag was introduced into military service professor lowe being made chief aeronautic engineer under lowe's direction the observation balloons played an important part in the operations of the union army on one occasion a young german military attache begged the privilege of making an ascent in the balloon permission was given and when the german officer returned to earth he was wildly enthusiastic in praise of this aerial observation post he had had a splendid view of the enemy and could watch operations through his field glasses which were of utmost importance realizing the military value of the aircraft he returned to germany and urged military authorities to provide themselves with captive balloons this young officer was count ferdinand von zeppelin who was destined later to become the most famous aeronautic authority in the world and who lived to see germany equipped with a fleet of balloons which were self-propelling and could travel over land and sea to spread german frightfulness into england he also lived to see the virtual failure of this type of war machine in the recent great conflict and it was possibly because of his deep disappointment at having his huge expensive airships bested by cheap little airplanes that count von zeppelin died in march nineteen seventeen however he was spared the humiliation of seeing a fleet of zeppelins lose their way in a fog and fall into france one of them being captured before it could be destroyed so that all its secrets of construction were learned by the french the weight of hydrogen before we describe the zeppelin airships and the means by which they were eventually overcome we must know something about the principles of balloons everyone knows that balloons are kept up in the air by means of a very light gas but somehow the general public fails to understand why the gas should hold it up some people have a notion that there is something mysterious about hydrogen gas which makes it resist the pull of gravity and that the more hydrogen you crowd into the balloon the more weight it will lift but hydrogen has weight and feels the pull of gravity just as air does or water or lead the only reason the balloon rises is because it weighs less than the air it displaces it is hard to think of air having weight but if we weigh air hydrogen coal gas or any other gas in a vacuum it will tip the scales just as a solid would a thousand cubic feet of air weighs eighty pounds in other words the air in a room ten feet square with a ceiling ten feet high weighs just about eighty pounds 
the same amount of coal gas weighed in a vacuum would register only forty pounds while an equal volume of hydrogen would weigh only five and a half pounds but when we speak of volumes of gas we must remember that gas unlike a liquid or a solid can be compressed or expanded to almost any dimensions for instance we could easily fill our room with a ton of air if the walls would stand the pressure or we could pump out the air until there were but a few ounces of air left but in one case the air would be so highly compressed that it would exert a pressure of about three hundred and seventy five pounds on every square inch of the wall of the room while in the other case its pressure would be almost infinitesimal but eighty pounds of air in a room of a thousand cubic feet would exert the same pressure as the atmosphere or fifteen pounds on every square inch and when we say that a thousand cubic feet of hydrogen weighs only a little over five pounds we are talking about hydrogen at the same pressure as the atmosphere since the hydrogen is sixteen times lighter than air naturally it will float in the air just as a piece of wood will float in water because it is lighter than the same volume of water if we surrounded the thousand cubic feet of hydrogen with a bag so that the gas will not diffuse into the air and mix with it we shall have a balloon which would float in air provided the bag and the hydrogen it contains do not weigh more than eighty pounds as we rise from the surface of the earth the air becomes less and less dense or in other words it becomes lighter and the balloon will keep on rising through the atmosphere until it reaches a point at which its weight gas bag and all is exactly the same as that of an equal volume of air but there are many conditions that affect the height to which the balloon will ascend the higher we rise the colder it is apt to become and cold has a tendency to compress the hydrogen collapsing the balloon and making it relatively heavier when the sun beats upon the balloon it heats the hydrogen expanding it and making it relatively lighter and if there is no room for this expansion to take place in the bag the bag will burst for this reason a big safety valve must be provided and the ordinary round balloon is open at the bottom so that the hydrogen can escape when it expands too much and the balloonist carries ballast in the form of sand which he can throw over to lighten the balloon when the gas is contracted by a sudden draught of cold air although the round balloon carries no engine and no propeller it can be guided through the air to some degree when an aeronaut wishes to go in any particular direction he sends up his balloon by throwing out ballast or lowers it by letting out a certain amount of gas until he reaches a level at which he finds a breeze blowing in the desired direction such was the airship of civil war times but for military purposes it was not advisable to use free balloons because of the difficulty of controlling them they were too liable to fall into the hands of the enemy all that was needed was a high observation post from which the enemy could be watched and from which observations could be reported by telegraph the balloon was not looked upon as a fighting machine zeppelin's failures and successes but count zeppelin was a man of vision he dreamed of a real ship of the air a machine that would sail wherever the helmsman chose regardless of wind and weather many years elapsed before he actually began to work out his dreams and then he met with failure after failure he believed in big machines and the loss of one of his airships meant the waste of a large sum of money but he persisted even though he spent all his fortune and had to go heavily in debt every one thought him a crank until he built his third airship and proved its worth by making a trip of two hundred and seventy miles at once the german government was interested and saw wonderful military possibilities in the new craft the zeppelin was purchased by the government and money was given the inventor to further his experiments that was not the end of his failures before the war broke out thirteen zeppelins had been destroyed by one accident or another evidently the building of zeppelin airships was not a paying undertaking although they were used to carry passengers on short aerial voyages but the government made up money losses and zeppelin went on developing his airships of course he was not the only one to build airships nor even the first to build a dirigible 
the french built some large dirigibles but they failed to see any great military advantage in ships that could sail through the air particularly after the airplane was invented and so it happened that when the war started the french were devoting virtually all their energies to the construction of speedy powerful airplanes as for the british they did not pay much attention to airships the idea that their isles might be attacked from the sky seemed an exceedingly remote possibility rigid semi-rigid and flexible balloons count zeppelin always held that the dirigible balloons must be rigid so that they could be driven through the air readily and could hold their shape despite variations in the pressure of the hydrogen the french on the other hand used a semi-rigid airship that is one in which a flexible balloon is attached to a rigid keel or body the british clung to the idea of an entirely flexible balloon and they suspended their car from the gas bag without any rigid framework to hold the gas bag in shape in every case the balloons were kept taut or distended by means of air bags or ballonets these air bags were placed inside the gas bags and as the hydrogen expanded it would force the air out through valves but the hydrogen itself would not escape when the hydrogen contracted the air bags were pumped full of air so as to maintain the balloon in its fully distended condition additional supplies of compressed hydrogen were kept in metal tanks in the zeppelin balloon however the gas was contained in separate bags which were placed in a framework of aluminum covered over with fabric count zeppelin did not believe in placing all his eggs in one basket if one of these balloons burst or was injured in any way there was enough buoyancy in the rest of the gas bags to hold up the airship as the zeppelins were enormous structures the framework had to be made strong and light and it was built up of a latticework of aluminum alloy aluminum itself was not strong enough for the purpose but a mixture of aluminum and zinc and later another alloy known as duralumin consisting of aluminum with three per cent of copper and one per cent of nickel provided a very rigid framework that was exceedingly light duralumin is four or five times as strong as aluminum and yet weighs but little more the body of the zeppelin is not a perfect circle in section but is made up in the form of a polygon with sixteen sides and the largest of the zeppelins used during the war contained sixteen compartments in each of which was placed a large hydrogen gas bag a super zeppelin as the latest type is called was about seventy-five feet in diameter and seven hundred and sixty feet long or almost as long as three new york street blocks in its gas bags it carried two million cubic feet of hydrogen and although the whole machine with its fuel stores and passengers weighed close to fifty tons it was so much lighter than the air it displaced that it had a reserve buoyancy of over ten tons keeping engines clear of the inflammable hydrogen as hydrogen is a very inflammable gas it is extremely dangerous to have an internal combustion engine operating very near the gas bags in the super zeppelins the engines were placed in four cars suspended from the balloon there was one of these cars forward and one at the stern while near the centre were two cars side by side in the rear car there were two engines either of which could be used to drive the propeller by means of large steering rudders and horizontal rudders the machine could be forced to dive or rise or turn in either direction laterally the pilot of the zeppelin had an elaborate operating compartment from which he could control the rudders and he also had control of the valves and the ballonets so that by the touch of a button he could regulate the pressure of gas in any part of the dirigible there were nineteen men in the crew of the zeppelin two in the operating compartment and two in each of the cars containing engines except for the one at the stern in which there were three men the other men were placed in what was known as the catwalk or passageway running inside the framework under the gas bags these men were given various tasks and were supposed to get as much sleep as they could so as to be ready to replace the other men if needed the engine cars at each side of the balloon were known as power eggs because of their general egg shape 
at the centre of the zeppelin the bombs were stored and there were electromagnetic releasing devices operated from the pilot's room by which the pilot could drop the bombs whenever he chose the zeppelin also carried machine guns to fight off airplanes gasoline was stored in tanks which were placed in various parts of the machine any one of which could feed one or all of the engines and they were so arranged that they could be thrown overboard when the gasoline was used up so as to lighten the load of the zeppelin water ballast was used instead of sand and alcohol was mixed with the water to keep it from freezing the machine which came down in french territory and was captured before it could be destroyed by the pilot found itself unable to rise because in the intense cold of the upper air the water ballast had frozen and it could not be let out to lighten the load of the zeppelin the zeppelin's tiny antagonists the one thing above all others that the zeppelin commander feared was the attack of airplanes in the early stages of the war it was considered unsafe for airplanes to fly by night because of the difficulty of making a landing in the dark later this difficulty was overcome by the use of searchlights at the landing fields the airplane would signal its desire to land and the searchlights would point out the proper landing field for it so that after the first few months of the war zeppelins were subjected to the danger of airplane attack of course on a dark night it was very difficult for an airplane to locate a zeppelin because the huge machine could not be seen and the throb of its engines was drowned out by the engines of the airplane itself nevertheless zeppelins were occasionally located and destroyed by airplanes the danger of the zeppelin lay in the fact that it was supported by an enormous volume of very inflammable gas and the airplane needed but to set fire to this gas to cause the destruction of the giant of the air and so the machine guns carried by airplanes were provided with explosive flaming bullets a burst of flame within the gas bag would not set the gas on fire because there would be no air inside to feed the fire but surrounding the gas bag there was always a certain leakage of hydrogen which would mix with the air in the compartment and this would produce an explosive mixture which needed but the touch of fire to set it off the zeppelin was provided with a ventilating system to carry off these explosive gases but they could never be disposed of very effectively and as a consequence a number of zeppelins were destroyed by the tiny antagonists that were sent up by the british and the french to fight off these assailants the germans provided their zeppelins with guns which would fire shrapnel shell it is difficult for a zeppelin to use machine guns against an airplane because the latter would merely climb above the zeppelin and would be shielded by the balloon itself and so the germans put a gun emplacement on top of the balloon both forward and aft there was a deck extending along the top of the balloon which was reached by a ladder running up through the center of the airship but it was impossible to ward off the fleet little antagonists once the dirigible was discovered true a zeppelin could make as much as seventy miles per hour but the fastest airplane could travel twice as fast as that suspending an observer below the zeppelin one ingenious scheme that was tried was to suspend an observation car under the zeppelin the car was about fourteen feet long and five feet in diameter fitted with a tail to keep it headed in the direction it was towed it had glass windows forward and there was plenty of room in it for a man to lie at full length and make observations of things below the car with its observer could be lowered a few thousand feet below the zeppelin so that the observer could watch proceedings below while the airship remained hidden among the clouds the observer was connected by telephone with the chart room of the zeppelin and could report his discoveries or even act as a pilot to direct the course of the ship but despite everything that could be done the zeppelin eventually proved a failure as a war vessel because it was so very costly to construct and operate and could so easily be destroyed and the germans began to build huge airplanes with which bombing raids could be continued strange to say however although the germans were ready to admit the failure of their big airship when the war stopped the allies were actually building machines patterned after the zeppelin but even larger and expected to use them for bombing excursions over germany 
this astonishing turn of the tables was due to the fact that america had made a contribution to aeronautics that solved the one chief drawback of the zeppelin a balloon gas that will not burn when we entered the war against germany our allies placed before us all their problems and among them was the one of the highly inflammable airship could we not furnish a substitute for hydrogen that would not burn it was suggested to us that helium would do if we could produce that gas cheaply and in sufficient quantity now helium has a history of its own that is exceedingly interesting every now and then the moon bobs its head into our light and we have a solar eclipse but our satellite is not big enough to cut off all the light of the big luminary and the fiery atmosphere of the sun shows us a brilliant halo all around the black disk of the moon long ago astronomers analyzed this flaming atmosphere with a spectroscope and by the different bands of light that appeared they were able to determine what gases were present in the sun's atmosphere but there was one band of bright yellow which they could not identify evidently this was produced by a gas unknown on earth and they called it helium or sun gas for a quarter of a century this sun gas remained a mystery then one day in eighteen ninety five sir william ramsay discovered the same band of light when studying the spectrum of the mineral clevite the fact that astronomers had been able to single out an element on the sun ninety million miles away before our chemists could find it right here on earth produced a mild sensation but the general public attached no special importance to the gas itself it proved to be a very light substance next to hydrogen the lightest of gases and for years it resisted all attempts at liquefaction only when ones the dutch scientist succeeded in getting it down to a temperature of four hundred and fifty degrees below zero fahrenheit did the gas yield to the chill and condense into a liquid the gas would not burn it would not combine with any other elements and apparently it had no use on earth and it might have remained indefinitely a lazy member of the chemical fraternity had not the great world conflict stirred us into frenzied activity in all branches of science in our effort to beat the hun because the gas had no commercial value there was only a small amount of helium to be found in the whole world not a single laboratory in the united states had more than five cubic feet of it and its price ranged from fifteen hundred dollars to six thousand dollars per cubic foot at the lowest price it would cost three billion dollars to provide gas enough for one airship of zeppelin dimensions and it seemed absurd even to think of a helium airship american chemists to the rescue just before the war it was discovered that there is a considerable amount of helium in the natural gas of oklahoma texas and kansas and sir william ramsay suggested that our chemists might study some method of getting helium from this source the only way of separating it out was to liquefy the gases by subjecting them to extreme cold all gases turn to liquid if they are cooled sufficiently and then further cold will freeze them solid but helium can stand more cold than any other and this fact gave the clue to its recovery from natural gas the latter was frozen and one after another the different elements condensed into liquid until finally only helium was left this sounds simple but it is a difficult matter to get such low temperature as that on a large scale and do it economically to be of any real service in aeronautics helium would have to be reduced in cost from fifteen hundred dollars to less than ten cents per cubic foot several different kinds of refrigerating machinery were tried and finally just before the war was brought to a close by the armistice we had succeeded in producing helium at the rate of eight cents per cubic foot with the prospect of reducing its cost still further a large plant for recovering helium was being built the plant will have been completed before this book is published and it will be turning out helium for peaceful instead of military airships the reduction in the cost of helium is really one of the most important developments of this war by removing the fire risk from airships we can safely use these craft for aerial cruises or for quick long-distance travel over land and sea 
for even in time of peace sailing under millions of cubic feet of hydrogen is a serious matter although no incendiary bullets are to be feared there is always the danger of setting fire to the gas within the exhaust of the engines engines have had to be hung in cars well below the balloon proper but with helium in the gas bags the engines can be placed inside the balloon envelope and the propellers can operate on the center line of the car in the case of one zeppelin the hydrogen was set on fire by an electric spark produced by friction on the fabric of one of the gas bags and so even with the engine exhaust properly screened there is danger the helium airship however would be perfectly safe from fire and passengers could smoke on deck or in their cabins within the balloon itself without any more fear of fire than they would have on shipboard wonderful possibilities have been opened by the production of helium on a large and economical scale and the airship seems destined to play an important part in transportation very soon as this book is going to press we learn of enormous dirigibles about to be built in england for passenger service which will have half again as great a lifting power as the largest zeppelins the final chapter of the story of dirigibles is yet to be written but in concluding this chapter it is interesting to note that the world's greatest aeronautic expert got his first inspiration from america and finally that america has now furnished the one element which was lacking to make the dirigible balloon a real success End of chapter eight